All right. So another expression that we see when we talk about waves is a way that we can express how the velocity of a wave on a stretched string will depend on some of the characteristics of that string. So I think the best way to understand that is to think about maybe a stringed instrument, like a guitar. Um, if you've had a chance to look at a guitar, you might notice that the different strings have different thicknesses. Um, you know, the lower strings are thicker than the higher strings. Um, and the other thing that you can do to those strings to change the sound that comes from them is to tighten those strings um, using the tuning pegs, um, you know, to make it more tight or less tight. So in a sense, those clues are telling us some of the things that are going to affect the way that a wave will travel through those guitar strings and then in, in the end make a sound. So the two things that we're talking about loosely when we think about the thickness of the strings and how tight they are, or um, the mass per unit length, that is how we would quantify the thickness of the strings. So we use the Greek letter mu, so we're recycling that from last semester. We're using the Greek letter mu to represent um, sort of the linear density of the string itself. So it's the mass per unit length, or if we want to think about taking a small increment of the length of the string, it's delta x, and that will give us a small increment of the mass delta m. The other thing that's going to affect how those waves travel is going to be the tautness of the way of the string, which is going to be the tension. Now, if we look at this picture right here, here we have a piece of string and it's at rest. It's in equilibrium. And so if we take a little piece, you know, right here, the shaded area is a little increment of the string, which would represent a certain mass of that string which could be calculated by finding the linear mass density of the string times the size or the length of the piece that we're looking at. And then if we think about the forces acting on that little element of the string, we have the tension in the string itself. On the right hand side, the force is acting to the right. And on the left hand side, the force is acting to the left. But because of the fact that the string is in equilibrium, those two forces of tension are equal and opposite. So that's where we start off with that idea. Now, if we pluck the string, we're going to create a disturbance that's going to be perpendicular to the length of the string itself. That's how you make a sound. You, you know, so we're pulling it and letting it go in a sense. Now, what's going to happen is we're sort of disturbing it in the y direction, but the wave will travel in the x direction. And what we want to get a sense of is can we determine how the speed of that wave travel is going to depend on these characteristics of the wave, which we decided would be important, which was the mass per unit length and the tension that's in the string. So let's take a look at like a little drawing that could represent what's happening. So if we imagine that um, we have plucked the string and now here's sort of a graph showing the wave that's traveling through the string. Now it's sort of blown up to be a little bit more obvious to us. And then we have taken a little piece of the string, like a increment that's delta x. And so we have a certain length of that. And we're going to be looking at the forces acting on that piece of string at the right hand side of it and the left hand side of it. Now we're still going to have those horizontal components of force, F sub T. And what's really important to think about is that those two tensions will have to remain equal and opposite to each other because think about what we have said about this type of transverse wave. This little piece of the string is just gonna be moving in the up and down direction. It is a transverse wave, and so this little piece does not move from side to side. 
And so in a sense, what we're saying is that the forces in the x direction have to be equal. So we have that tension um, on the right hand side acts to the right and the tension on the left hand side acts to the left and they're equal and opposite to each other. What, what we do have to have is there has to be a net force in the y direction which is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. And in order to figure that out we need to know what F1 and F2 are. Now admittedly this is a little bit small, but um, F2 is the vertical force on the right hand piece of that increment of the string, the little piece that we took, and F1 is on the left hand side. And so F2 is up, F1 is down. If we're looking at sort of the relationships, you notice we also are looking at that angle that the weight, the little piece of the string is making with respect to the x-axis. And so if we think about that, um, the angle on the left-hand piece is, we're gonna call theta one, and that's equal to, the tangent of that is equal to minus F1 over Ft, and the tangent of that angle on the right-hand side is F2 over Ft. And so those are what we're going to um, be looking at. Now, think about what tangent is. Tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. It's the rise over the run. So both of these expressions also represent the slope of the um, wave, the slope of the wave function, if we're looking at it in a snapshot in time. And so these both represent dy dx, this would be the one at location x sub 1. So because right here, this left hand side is called x sub 1 and y sub 1, and then the right hand side is x sub 2, y sub 2. And so just representing again, what we're saying is the tangent of that angle represents the slope because it's the rise over the run. And if you, um, you know, this is how we would find the slope of the wave function, we would have to take its derivative with respect to x. And we're looking at a particular location, and that's what this is about. It's just telling us that that's where we're looking for it. So we have that these are, these ratios of forces are equal to the slopes. And so, what are we gonna do with that? We're gonna look at the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times acceleration. And so, for instance, um, our net force is gonna be F2 minus F1. The mass is going to be mu delta x and the acceleration is the second derivative of the y with respect to time. Again, remember how acceleration is determined. It's a derivative of that function with respect to time. How is it changing in time? It's the second derivative. And so the F2 we can write as Ft times the derivative of that function with respect to x at x2. F1 is equal to um, the derivative of y with respect to x at x1. This is equal to mu delta x d squared y dt squared. Now, so this is what we've we've arrived at, this is, we're still just using, um, I'm sorry, this should be an F sub two. So this whole thing is supposed to represent F1, which can be found on, um, by looking at Ft. We're just rearranging these expressions right here. Still Newton's second law, but we wanna try to simplify it somehow. I'm gonna give you a hint, we're trying to get at the wave equation. And so, um, 
and we want to get rid of some of these extra terms. So we're going to, if we notice, there's an FT in both of these terms, and so we want to divide everything through by FT. We're also going to divide by um, delta X. So we're going to divide this whole equation by FT and delta X, and we're going to take the limit of this as delta X goes to zero. Now, on the left-hand side, what is going to happen is we're going to get dy dx at x2 minus dy dx at x1 over delta x, which is actually really just, by definition, is just the second derivative of y with respect to x when we take the limit. On the right hand side, so this is all on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we're going to get mu over ft in the second derivative of y with respect to t squared. Okay. So, where are we going to go with that? We need a little bit more room, so I'm going to make, I'm going to erase this right here. So again, just to remind you, we used f equals ma, we did some manipulation to our equation. We found the left-hand side of our equation was simply equal to the second derivative of y with respect to x, and the right-hand side of that equation ended up to be mu over ft times the second derivative of y with respect to time. So putting it together. Sorry, I just drew over my picture. Now, we did a lot of manipulation with this expression, and it turns out that we come up with a form that actually looks like the wave equation. We might not have recognized it right away, but here, I'm gonna remind you, this is what the wave equation looks like, and this is what we got for this expression. What that means is that this term right here represents one over the speed squared of this wave. So we actually can say that V is equal to the square root of the tension in the string divided by the mass per unit length. And so that kind of fits a little bit with what we know. We have to go over and learn some a little bit more about the waves traveling on a string, but in a sense, if you think about it, how fast that wave is going to sort of be able to travel is gonna have something to do with the force that tries to bring it back to equilibrium, and um, the inertia of that string itself. And so, you know, the inertia is gonna have a role too, which is in, included in that mass per unit length. And so this is how we come up with this expression of how a wave, how fast a wave travels on a stretch string, and the fact that it depends on the tension of the string and the mass linear density.